we're pushing the limits of what we're trying to do physically, mentally, emotionally, and that comes out as tears sometimes. You obviously don't want to be crying all the time, but I would almost say, <laughs> like, if you're not crying once in a while, then uh, are you really going hard enough? Do you really care enough about this? What does it mean to navigate the Olympic stream? What can we learn from the journey, the destination, and beyond? I'm Adam Creek, and this is Row Row Tokyo, exploring the past, present, and future of the Canadian rowing athletes on their path to Tokyo 2020. Friends, we got a good one for you today. Kaylee Cannonball Filmer and Hillary Kill Jansons, giving them nicknames today. Uh, they call themselves the workhorses, and these two ladies are incredible athletes. Uh, we'll go deeper into into their pasts, uh, especially uh, Kaylee Filmer. Her past of being a, a a swimmer, an elite swimmer who had a lot of potential within that sport and ended up transitioning into rowing and uh, described her perspective as as a young person who's now now matured and much older and has that perspective so i think it'll be interesting not only for young athletes who might who be listening but also for parents who are listening and and pushing their children down the high performance or pathway Dial in, listen to Kaylee Cannonball Filmer and Hillary Kill Jansons. Hillary Jansons, Kaylee Filmer, welcome to Row Row Tokyo. Thank you for having us. You've had a longstanding partnership. Uh, you've had some great successes uh, in the past. And so I want to really understand the the journey of each of you. So I'd like to start with, with Hillary. Can you tell me your, oh, your rowing journey? Well, uh, I grew up in Cloverdale, BC. I uh, played sports when I was young, um, a lot of basketball, and I was okay, but not amazing. And I think my parents encouraged sports, but they were never crazy sports parents. <laughs> um, they didn't really like Care if I was the most amazing. They just wanted me to be healthy and happy and doing what I wanted to do. And then I chose to go to UBC in Vancouver for school. And just walking around campus on the first day, I got approached by people from the rowing team uh, multiple different times, uh, handing me an invite to the information meeting, um, recruiting for the rowing team, the novice walk-on team. So I went to the meeting because I wanted to do something at school. I wanted to be involved. I wanted to have friends. I wanted to stay relatively healthy <laughs> by exercising. And I remember at the introduction meeting, there was Ben Rutledge was there speaking to this random group of 80 to 100 people who thought they might want to try rowing at university. And he said how he was in a meeting like this. and. 10 or 15 years ago, and he's an Olympic champion. And I thought, oh, wow, that's crazy. It probably won't be me, but I don't know. I'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah, and then through through UBC, I just started to row, and I didn't, didn't like fall in love with it right at the beginning, but I guess I just certainly didn't find any reasons to not keep going to rowing. I didn't... <laughs> I, I just I just want to repeat that you didn't fall no, in love. Not, with not that, right away, and I there's no real reason to stop. <laughs> Sounds like the perfect start to a love story, really. One of the questions on the little like bookmark that they handed out was, "Do you like to push your physical limits?" And I was like, mm, "I really am not sure about that one." But that that is obviously I didn't know myself very well because that's I very much like to do that. <laughs> that's great. So you thought that you didn't like to push your limits, but then you figured out that you do like to push your limits. So what can you think of a, an actual experience where you discovered that you wanted to find the next level? I got a lot of my earlier, earlier successes on the year. Again, that's just really a motivating thing to see when you push yourself and you put yourself in some pain and 
you go faster than the person next to you who is also hurting themselves. And that's, that's a pretty powerful thing to feel that your best effort can put you above some other people. My first ERG competition ever, it was um, Beat the Beast at St. George's and I was on the novice team. So I was pretty new and I didn't really know what to expect, but we had, and we hadn't done a two gate before. So we lined up in the gym and I was seated next to this other girl named Hillary, which was <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, and then we're doing this 2K and we get the the times are up on the board and we're really, really close to each other, both the Hillary's and we're leading everyone else by quite a decent amount. And then uh, I just remember like, oh, my legs suddenly felt like concrete and I had never felt that before. And it was like, oh my gosh, she beat me by like two seconds in the end. Um, but it was just so exciting because I had like the whole UBC varsity team um, behind me cheering and they were getting so excited for this race. And I was like, Oh my gosh, they're cheering for me right now. That's crazy. Yeah. That was just such a fun thing to be a part of and to experience that and feel like, like I could maybe do something with this if I keep training. What do you tell yourself when, when you start hitting that threshold and when you start feeling that pain and concrete, concrete legs? That's when it's even more important to make sure your blade is doing the right thing and your body is doing the right thing. If the bow speeds up and your legs can't quite push as hard, you can still keep the boat going if you're <laughs> using your body correctly and just maybe hoping that other people can <laughs> can keep going when you're not. So I hope that Bailey has a little more juice sometimes when I'm failing, but... Uh, we we can uh, we can trade off sometimes, but I'm just kidding. That's not actually how it works. <laughs> Somewhere in my brain, I'm probably hoping that Kaylee is doing better than I am in those moments. <laughs> well, Kaylee, come in. Well, we kind of have sometimes joked about us having like different strengths in the race. I mean, of course, I feel like for us to have had the results that we've had, we both must be pretty darn good at a lot of parts of the race, but. I definitely think that there's like strengths and I think we complement each other well. There is something to be said about that in a pair in the partnership and the compliments. And I think we'll get into that in a little bit later. And I, I want to get into, actually, I want to finish Hillary's story. You're at UBC. So tell me how you moved from UBC to the Canadian national team. Well, my first summer of rowing, I went to Canada Summer Games and raced the pair in the eight. And that was a really good experience, just racing and meeting a few different people. And then, yeah, next year going back to school, I was a lot more confident and like sure that I was not only on the rowing team, but I kind of was meant to be there and I was excited to help lead the team. So meant to be, tell me, was it just the results that gave you that feeling of, of purpose and this is my place? As shallow as it might seem, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I think I, I did well in the summer. I won the pair in the eight at Canada Games, and I just felt that I, I knew I had a decent shot at continuing to accelerate, and we had a good group of girls on the team, and it, it, uh, it was exciting to be a part of. Also that fall, Lauren Wilkinson, an Olympic silver medalist, came to row to do her master's at UBC, and I was lucky enough to be in a pair with her after just a year of rowing. So yeah, my coach Craig Pond was really obviously instrumental in helping me progress the way I did. And part of it was the people that I got to row with were, were really good at UBC from pretty early on. So you pick up good habits from people around you. And yeah. Tell me the number one thing you learned from Lauren Wilkinson. And then I want to dig into Craig Pond. I'd, I'd say Lauren is a bit of a quieter character, um, but just her her confidence and her role on the team, even though she was older and obviously way more decorated than any of us, she certainly didn't act like it. And when someone like that comes into your team, they don't have to speak very much for their words to mean a lot when they do speak. Yeah, and she was just so like patient with me and positive when we were in the boat together and she just really didn't make it seem scary. I remember after a race, like 
4K time trial at Bruna be like, she like a pause. She's like, Hillary, I'm so sorry. I started rowing short. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, what are you doing apologizing to me? I've been rowing for like 12 months, Lauren. <laughs> um, so she was just so humble and so like open minded and eager to learn. Yeah, that is inspiring. I love that story about Lauren. What a woman. So the, and now Craig Pond, Craig Pond was your coach. What did you learn from, from him and the program that he put together? Craig was, yeah, Craig was a great coach. He, uh, he just looked out for his athletes and he, I think he knew how to create an environment where people were pushing themselves and there was a lot of positive growth and he kind of let the team's energy buoy itself. And so we, when I was at UBC, we had a really strong eight. We won, we won the Canadian university eight every year I was there. And I think that was a lot of him just like being patient and trusting his athletes. He obviously knew or helped me get to the point where I realized I could go onto the national team. And he was just adamant about not skipping steps in my development. So he, like, he really believed in getting really good at your school before you get good domestically, before you even try to race internationally. I like how you said he built an environment that pushed success and he was able to even step back in the process and let the environment push you, which I think I've seen that in a lot of very great coaches. You know, sometimes we want it all right now and we can't get it all right now. We have to go through the process to get to that next level. And so you went through the process and in the process, you went to under 23s. That's right? Yes. Yeah. My first year um, was in a four. And we got had an awesome regatta. We won a bronze medal. And that was just felt like a gold medal. It was so awesome to be racing internationally and to, to see what we could do. And so how did you make it from the under 23 team to the senior national team? Yeah. First under 23s was a bronze in the four. Second under 23s uh, was a silver in the four with Kaylee and Nicole, um, Nicole Hare. And then after 2015, Kaylee and I actually raced the pair together at the National Rowing Championships, which we won. Um, so we beat all the women who had qualified the eight for Rio. Because of that, we got invited into the Olympic camp. We moved to London in early 2016. Kaylee made the eight for Rio. Sorry for butting in on your story, Kaylee. <laughs> Nicole raced in the pair in Rio and I was a spare, so I didn't race. Um, but I traveled and I was around the team. And then after the Olympics in that August, Nicole and I raced the pair at under 23s and we won that. That was a really good experience just because I was obviously disappointed to not race at the Olympics and to go back to U23s after being at the Olympics, it just kind of felt like a, this is funny, but it felt like a really fun graduation ceremony to go from the senior level where I clearly wasn't at the top of, obviously, <laughs> I wouldn't even make a racing boat, but to go back down to U23s and realize how far I had come from my previous U23 experiences was really just like, okay, I know that if I keep doing this, I can do well at seniors. I've officially graduated U23s with this gold medal. And I think that meant a lot for both Nicole and I to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, that's meaningful. That's really meaningful. I love the way that you put that. Yeah. And so after Rio, Tokyo was in your sights. So how did that look? Did you take some time off or did you say well, training starts tomorrow? No. So I, I did. I had one more year of school left. I took a semester off in early 2016. So you went, you finished up your, your bachelor of science degree in biology. Is that right? Correct. Yes. You finished up the school and then you came in and I see 2017, you were in the eight. Yeah. Uh, you went to Florida world championships. You got a silver there. Yeah. So what happened? That was a really uh, special team to be a part of just because we, literally only had eight people training that summer together and we didn't have extra bodies and we didn't really know what to expect internationally just because after the after an olympic year you kind of get a reshuffling of things and 
people retire and new countries have more growth and yeah and that that was the Rietta that uh the first time the Canadian eight beat the American eight after quite a long time at the senior level so just being with a lot of the women who had lost so many times to the states getting the upper hand on them uh, is just you just feel like you can do anything when there's a shuffling like that and that was just really exciting to be a part of so yeah it's a good race and then you were in the pair in bulgaria 2018 yeah Yeah, kaylee and i were put in the pair early that season went to a world cup and won it so we're like okay this is promising and then we went to the world cup three and raced the kiwis who were the world champions and world record holders and they're just really really (laughs) very accomplished and we had a really good race against them in Lucerne and lost to them by 0.4 seconds or something. So that was like, oh, wow, we're we're pretty close to like the best pair in the world. And we were together. Our two boats were 10 seconds ahead the rest of the field. So then we went into world champs and we worked on some things and we knew that like we obviously could find 0.4 seconds somewhere because you always tell yourself that, right? <laughs> you're not you're not ever operating it. You can never say I did that perfectly. Um, And then, yeah, we went to Bulgaria, had a good training camp in Greece beforehand. And I think we're just excited to see what we could do because we were, once again, the underdogs. Um, I don't think many people would have guessed us to beat the Kiwis at Regatta, but yeah, we did. We faced them in the semifinals, which is a little unusual because we were probably ranked one and two. So in the semifinal, we went out really hard to the 1k and we were up a length and it was like oh this is this is interesting and then last few hundred meters of that race of the semi-final we were I was pretty comfortable with the lead we had so I started to take the rate down a little bit um just to make it look easy and not waste a sprint if we didn't have to sprint and at that point Kaylee sits behind me and makes the calls and she made the call for our mothers because she thought I was like she thought I was dying and she thought I was like she to relate it back to when she thought I probably had concrete legs and she thought I was physically like not going to make it the last couple hundred meters but I was just trying to like be really relaxed and long because you know when a, a crew finishes a race and they look like they're not working that's what I was aiming for but Kaylee thought I was dying and both our parents were there and she said for our mothers and I'm like after the race I'm like why on earth did you say that I had thought she was dying because <laughs> she she had like started to shift or like shift down and looked really smooth but in the moment I was like oh no her body's shutting down oh no we need to get to the finish line <laughs> so so why the mom uh, call like I love it <laughs> I've never had that once in my entire career. I've never had one say. Why wouldn't you have that call? It's so wonderful. I don't know. It is. It is. It's magical. Like of course, uh, both of our moms had made the trip out, and I know for both of us, um, that was like pretty meaningful to have our moms there, and we're both quite close with our moms, and so that was just particularly <laughs> like really just like special to share that with them. Tell me about your mom. Hillary, and then then we're going to go back to Kaylee, back to the beginning of Kaylee. But first, I want to hear about Hillary's mom, and then I want to hear about Kaylee's mom, and then we're going to go back to Kaylee. Sure. <laughs> Kaylee being raised by her mom, coming to now. Uh, well, my mom and dad were both there. My mom and dad are both great. Um, and yeah, I, I just, uh, they've always supported me, and I, part of the Part of the thing that's been so difficult about everything that's been cancelled during COVID and looking forward to the Olympics, um, it, it's really hard to think about the fact that my parents and and my sister won't be able to be there um, watching in person. That's that kind of makes me uh, makes me a little bit sad just because I know how much joy that's brought them in the past to be able to watch me race internationally and just do what I love. Yeah. Well, that will be disappointing. The I, I'll, I'm going to throw in a mom story because my mom wasn't able to make it to my Olympics. And right after the Olympics, the, one of the first things I did was I, I found a cell phone and I was like, I got to call my mom. And I'm like, mom, mom, 
I just won the Olympics. And then she's like, yes, dear. I know. I was watching. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> That's probably what my it's mom like, would say. Thanks, well. mom. <laughs> <laughs> well and it's uh it's great it's you know it's humbling it's 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 amazing how even you know at the height of athletic accomplishment you're still you know you're still the daughter or the son of you know a mother who birthed you and nursed you and raised you and loved you and there's something powerful there's something truly powerful about that so tell me about your mom and then Tell me about how your mom contributed to your path and let's start from the beginning and bring you all, bring us all up to Plovdiv and Bulgaria and that world championship. Yeah. So, uh, my mom actually that year going into Plovdiv, I think it was two to three months leading into it. I found out that my mom had been diagnosed with, um, ovarian cancer. We didn't know what stage it was at, and so eventually we found out that she would be able to go under surgery and then further treatment. And because of going through the treatments um, leading in, she had been told by her doctors that she wouldn't be able to come watch us. Within a week of us leaving, my mom found out that she had been told that she was cancer-free and that she would be, she had just finished her last treatment and would be allowed to come out and watch. And so... I just have this like really clear memory of when we finished in our final and had won and just both of us like sobbing into each other's like mom's arms and it was just like so special. I call her my super mommy and um, she calls me superwoman. My mom is my best friend and before I, I'll get into this later, but before I rode, I was a competitive swimmer and it was always, I'm a twin sister. And so my mom always took me to my swim practices and drove me around everywhere and anywhere and just dedicated her life to taking care of me because it worked out that she, that worked with her work schedule. And then my twin sister who were very different in so many ways and she was very always involved and team sports and soccer, which was what my dad um, had done growing up. And so my dad was her coach for her soccer team and they would go and do their soccer thing. My mom had been, um, my mom rode for the University of Victoria and then she was on the national team and had gotten a stress fracture during the selection for um, the Olympics that she was leading into. And so she didn't go to the Olympics, but had had that rowing past and growing up she actually kind of discouraged me or always like kind of pushed me away from the rowing scene I think um she really enjoyed seeing me in other sports and then uh when I eventually tried rowing I guess I think she kind of knew it was coming eventually what's her name Helena uh Filmer and her maiden name is Matson. And t- take me the path. Take me the path from competitive swimmer to Plovdiv. Yeah, so I was 13 years old, I think it was, when I uh, retired from competitive swimming. I had been a competitive swimmer for seven years, and so I guess I had just started early. And had been on the summer before I was on the junior national team. At the age of 13? Uh, for the 12 and under national team. Okay. What uh, distances did you swim and what disciplines? My my main events were the 400, 800, and 1500 meter freestyle. And then they were, were wanting to gear me towards becoming an open water specialist. And so I had made the national team based on my distance FINA points, I guess is how the swimming world had done it back then. And had made the junior team that went to the North American Challenge Cup in California. And um, the next year when I'd come back in training, I just, I'd gone through my first big injury. I had a knee injury um, that took me out for a little bit. And I came back and was going quite fast. And I just didn't love it. And I 
cried every morning going to practice and my mom drove me to practice every morning and just like supportive about me doing something exactly kind of what Hillary's mom was to her with sports and just wanted me to do something that I loved because I was so young that I could do anything at that point like it didn't make sense to keep doing something that wasn't making me happy even though I was really good at it and so I know that my mom had to go through when I decided to retire quite a difficult period of time because I think some some parents they don't they wouldn't realize it but in the moment because I guess in the swim world the moms sit and watch practice they all right all the meets they know a lot of them know every other swimmers times and it's pretty intense world and so they had they they just see this little swimming athlete who had been doing really well and suddenly she doesn't want to swim anymore and they thought that my mom was making a mistake letting me retire from swimming and thought that that I had been throwing away everything that I was working for but you were happy you were happy with the support oh yeah like I had I loved my coach I loved my teammates I just didn't love swimming anymore and so I had retired and that um I think in about June and then that summer. Well, I want you to talk about your mom too in that situation <laughs> because I think there's there's going to be parents who are listening to this, mm-hmm. you know, people who are older who are raising children and even myself, right? I'm yeah, it's kind of funny. I'm, I've got my legs in both worlds cuz you know, having been an athlete myself, but now I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, 7-year-old girl and a 10-year-old boy and a uh, uh, four-year-old boy and you want to support your children and sport is important up to a point but you can also see sport sport can become something that's very toxic mm-hmm. in you know in the life of a child and uh and and can move from being of benefit to their their emotional development, psychological development, physical development, cognitive development, and um, move to the other place where it becomes detrimental. Yeah, and starts to take away. So, I just wanted to talk about your mom and, and explain her decision more and how she was able to support you and some of and often it's the social pressure, right? It, exactly. It's the social pressure that's the most difficult part of making these decisions. I still remember the first training camp that I ever went on. Um, it was a going away spring break training camp. I think I was 10 years old and it was two weeks going away to California, 10 years old, away from your parents. And I was the youngest girl on the team getting to go in this camp. And some of the moms of the other girls my age, I think reflected poorly on my mom for making the decision to let me go, which is crazy. Uh, but my mom just like supported me and if it was something that would allow me to help achieve my goals that I had then she would support me and if she thought that like if it's different than what other parents thought she didn't really care what anybody thought she just wanted me to be happy and for me to feel supported so I I knew that I was pretty done with swimming I think that year around April-ish and then my mom because we had our first big meet um coming up I think it was June beginning of June and it was the regional championships and my mom uh so I had told her like mom I think I'm done I don't want to swim anymore and she said okay I want you to keep training for four more weeks and I want you to race and then tell me after you race how you feel Um, because she's like, of course, like you've been doing this for a really long time. So I don't want you to just give on it. Like, I don't want you to just make a decision right now based on training. I want you to go out there and race because I think she was worried that I'd just come back off of an injury. So now with your age and perspective, do you think that was good advice? I I completely agree. I think that it, I think at that age, you are so young. And so I think it's good to just really make sure that you're making the right decisions and because it was a lot riding on it for me because I had set up my entire life of swimming and I had dreams of going to an American university, getting a scholarship. I 
I wanted to go to the Olympics, but I wasn't set on it, but I was more so at that age focused on not staying in Victoria for university. And I think every single time I went and visited my grandparents on both sides, I'd be like, yep, I'm only here for so many more years, then I'm going to go away to California. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you, you grew up in Victoria, British Columbia. I just want to make sure that that's on the yep. record. Yeah. Victoria, BC. And then... Graduate of Mount Mount Douglas Secondary School. Yeah. Okay. And so my mom, um, yeah, she got me to still race at the regionals. And I wasn't sure how I was going to go because I had had a knee injury earlier in the spring. And then I ended up setting almost all best times at that meet, even though I didn't want to so many more. And I was just like, you know what? Just go and race your hardest. It is what it is. And do something that's going to make you proud and that you're going to look back on fondly. And I think the last day I ever raced in the pool was June 11th. <laughs> Still remember that day. I was pretty pleased with how I was doing. And so I think that especially the fact that I had just hit all best times, other parents were just scratching their heads and going what are you doing, Helena? How are you letting your daughter um, stop stop swimming? Did So did you sense that as a kid? Or was this a conversation you had with your mom afterwards? My dad actually told me these things. <laughs> yeah. So I'm also quite close to my dad. And my dad and I would go on these little car rides. And my dad would be like, oh, the other swim moms are being hard on your mom. You should really support your mom. Or he would he would kind of like fill me in on the things that my mom wouldn't tell me and I think it's something that I really admire about my mom and I think it shaped me into who I am and my mom just really couldn't hurt a fly and doesn't like to say anything bad about anyone never complains and so and it's just like so genuinely kind and so she she would never tell me that she was struggling amongst like a, a parent group or was struggling or was tired from di driving me to training. Like she just always put on a good face. And she told me that summer that she wanted me to start thinking about getting involved in the sport. And I think she was always worried about some, like me not being involved in sports and then ending up not with the greatest group of friends or not with a good support system. And so she just firmly always believed in that's not not even that you need to be in high performance sport but just that sport would give you that amazing experience that would just like help I guess guide you towards some of like your tougher years or that could be your tougher years mm -hmm. well and it's you know sport exercise is not just the body but the character mm-hmm and then, so I was looking in this, like, little catalog of these summer camps, and I came across the Victoria City Rowing Club Learn to Row Summer Camps, because I had graduated from middle school, sitting on the couch. I love watching TV and being a blob and doing nothing. And my mom actually said, Haley, you need to start getting active a bit because you're eating like a swimmer, yet you're not doing anything. <laughs> like you either need to decide to go get yourself off the couch and stop being a couch potato or start not eating plates on plates on plates on plates <laughs> it was shocking sometimes when I swam like I think one time one of my friends challenged me to eat 18 inches of subway and then another time someone challenged me to eat a dozen donuts and you just can when you're training that much yeah. <laughs> you're pitless yeah. So <laughs> feed the furnace. <laughs> and I always kind of thought it was funny, even though I would be dying of stomach pain for the next like couple of days. But I thought it was hilarious that I could just stuff so much food down. Um, so I think I grew my stomach out. And yeah, so my mom encouraged me to stop being a couch potato and start getting active again. And that I, she told me I had to sign up for a sport in the fall. And so. I was like, okay, hey, cool. I can, I know rowing is offered at Mount Doug and I could do the summer camp to see how I like it. And I did the summer camp 
and I absolutely hated it. I, <laughs> I guess maybe that was maybe a bit more strongly than Hill, but I didn't have this first love with rowing and compared to swimming where I wasn't the most technical person, but because of my work ethic, I kind of just bulldozed through the water and by the way that I trained, I just did well because I always worked really hard. And so when I jumped into a boat, I thought it was the most horrible sport ever because it was so hard, the technique and having to like, I thought that the whole moving the blade handles to feather and square and to get the blades into the water and then the timing thing and all of these like coordination parts of rowing just threw me off and compared to swimming where I kind of just did my thing and it was individual and you bulldoze through all of a sudden in this boat couldn't figure it out and I was sitting there just scratching my head and I was like I am so fit this should be easy but suddenly there's this technical aspect that you can't get past or else you flip <laughs> <laughs> and so then I did the summer camps and kind of did it was like okay that was a workout cool got to the fall and then mom was like okay hey, well you better sign up for a sport and then I was like well rowing's the one that I like I didn't love it but I was like well I don't dislike it compared to a lot of other sports <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's you and Hell together. Well, it's, <laughs> I didn't love this, but uh, I, I kept getting better at it, so I figured I should. Because I, I, I enjoy sports that, I guess, the yeah. harder you work, the faster you go. Um, like, I'm not, like, naturally the fastest runner, but I can just run forever, and I can hold the same speed. And so then as distances kind of get longer, it, it I start doing relatively better and better and so I guess kind of like same scheme of that I I guess sports where it's more individual and more just like power and fitness um I've done well in and then every other sport that was offered at Mount Doug was all the team sports like basketball soccer um those type things which you don't want to see Kaylee play a ball sport <laughs> It is. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe She's, I just. It is. It's shocking <laughs> how, how, like, how natural she can be in one athletic sense and how unnatural in another one. But. <laughs> A huge thank you to our title sponsor, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. Nicola Wealth is also the premier partner of the Can Fund 150 Women, where women support female athletes and each other to achieve excellence. Nicola Wealth also has their own podcast, The Wealth Exchange. This show is full of great interviews and inspires you to achieve your aspirations beyond wealth. Providing access to experts, topics explore leadership impact, wealth planning and investing, philanthropy and building better businesses. Listen to The Wealth Exchange with a quick search for Nicola Wealth on your favorite podcast listening app. So let's, let's go through Mount Doug. Give me the highlights of Mount Doug. Got into rowing, Mount Doug fall, and I started like getting past the technical part. And I guess what really did help me start to accelerate my rowing career was the fact that I had my baseline fitness from swimming and so I knew how to push myself and I guess that that similar to Hillary I started doing really well as a novice on the erg suddenly was put into these senior novice instead of junior novice races and then got to race in the senior versus the eight my my grade nine year um, as a novice and I don't I don't wish to see video of that race ever, but I guess I pulled hard, but might have stuck out like a sore thumb. And then through my, so then after the fall, because in Victoria, you row for your high school in the fall, and then you join a club for winter, spring, summer. And so then I started rowing for the Victoria City Rowing Club, and I had different coaches, I think, each like grade 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, 
there's kind of like different coaches, different um, like assistant coaches. And then some years, like as you got um, higher up in the in your grade, there tended to be like the woman's spring and summer head coach was Jesse Hume. And the on the men's side, it was Albert Ben Scotthorst, who's now the University of Victoria men's um, head coach. I'd say like the coaches who were most instrumental in my like big grade 11, 12 years. So what did, so what did Jesse give you? And then what did Albert give you? I think that they're very different coaches for sure. So Albert was the coach of the fall high performance development program, which was a program of just six girls and six guys. And you applied to the program and it was the top athletes of the club. And I did that my grade 10, 11, and 12 year. And so we just did small boat training. And you did that instead of your high school program because in BC, you can only train four times a week. But in order to make a, like, a junior national team, the club believed that you needed to train a little bit more than that and be over the hours that would make you eligible to race the school program. And so... Albert was my coach during the falls and then during the springs I moved into Jesse's program and so I and Jesse was the grade 11 12 women's head coach and Jesse very much was more so of a quiet quieter coach a lot more hands off but I think it really taught me to be like quite independent and he really just brought together the groups of girls and it was a very great culture in my junior rowing program. So Jesse was encouraging, quiet, hands off. Yeah. Taught independence. Yeah. And it's kind of like that, like quietness where you don't often get a lot of good jobs. Then when he would like smile, like he'd give this little smile or this big, like that was well done. And it was kind of like, whew. That was good. <laughs> I, I I got made fun of a lot for how much I cried sometimes. And Albert said, Albert used to sometimes say that my tears were my pain coming out of my eyeballs. The boys used to make fun of the girls because the girls cried a lot in practice. And let's talk about let's talk about crying and talk about what it means, like as a girl and then as a woman. Because I also want to bring this in too, because you know our our sponsor of the podcast is Nicola Wealth, who is a big sponsor of the Can Fund, uh, the 150 Women Project, and and so this is this theme is sort of is coming through because I know each of you have been recipients of of the Can Fund. You know Jane Roos. And uh, like myself, they've uh, I benefited from uh, the Can Fund when I was an athlete. But this this idea of 150 women, women supporting women, and uh, you know, I'm I'm mildly fascinated with uh, women's athletics because it is so young, and I'm also fascinated by the fact that you know most of your early coaches were not women. Your early coaches were men, which is you know. Uh, you know, I also find interesting. And so crying is something that's more, you know, that tends to be more feminine. So yet you own it, which I think is amazing, right? <laughs> I love how Albert put it. Tears are just pain coming through your eyeballs. So, <laughs> so, so tell me about, you know, as a girl and you're now a woman, how have you made peace with your tears? And how have you made peace with your, with, with that emotional part of your being? Oh, I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to count the amount of times I've cried in practice, but, and I, I really appreciate too that I think, I mean, Hill can speak to this, but I think both of us are just very open in how we're feeling to each other. And I think that if like I'm crying and I start talking to Hill, I'm going to start bawling. And I think like vice versa, like we can't hide our emotions around each other which I think is honestly the best and it allows us to like be able to support each other properly and be vulnerable. And you know what? Sometimes practice freaking sucks and crying through it might make you feel better. <laughs> I'm also a crier and uh, I guess I'm just thankful that I'm, I'm uh, 
with someone who also cries and it's okay to cry once in a while. We don't cry all the time, but just being with someone and you see someone crying and you're just like, oh, they're having a hard day. And sometimes you can go up to them and sometimes you're just like, maybe they just want to be alone. And it's, we're, what we're trying to do is it's so intense emotionally. And I think, yeah, we're always at our breaking or not always at our breaking point, but we're, we're pushing the limits of what we're trying to do physically, mentally, emotionally. And that comes out as tears sometimes. You obviously don't want to be crying all the time, but I would almost say, <laughs> like, if, if you're not crying once in a while, then uh, are you really going hard enough? Do you really care enough about this? I don't know. Let's tell me, each of you, I want you each to tell me about the last time you cried. Yeah, I just, I've had some, a pretty long year in terms of injury. And because of that, I spend a lot of time on the spin bike. And yeah, there were some workouts doing alone and just really trying to push myself physically and just being isolated and not knowing if I'd be able to get back in the boat and be strong and be my best at the Olympics. Like there were some dark moments when it is really hard (laughs) to, to not let it get the best of you sometimes. Thankfully that's, that's behind me for the most part. So I'm glad that part is over. (laughs) It's over. Well, and let's go back to that, right? Because I think this is this is interesting, and this is sort of this is the legacy piece that I'm interested in. You know, of the podcast, you're isolated, you're alone, you're on the spin bike, you know, you're pushing yourself to physical pain. There's uncertainty: Am I going to heal? Is my body going to, you know, respond? You know, I've, and I'll speak from personal experience, you go from a point from where you're pushing your body and your role and your job is to push your body. And all of a sudden your body is not cooperating and it's your body that's pushing back on you. You know, you're there, you're on the spin bike. You're wondering if you're going to, uh, (laughs) your, you know, your injury is going to heal. The tears come out. Then what? I'll say something something that got me through a lot of those long hours on the bike, not crying a lot of them, I promise. Um, I listened to just a lot of podcasts. And there was, I found a podcast mostly with, uh, where they interviewed rowers. And suddenly I listened to a few of them with, um, they were interviewing the best rowers. Like, historically, they, I remember they had Drew Jin and Kim Brennan and just so many. And then Suddenly in these podcasts, I started realizing a recurring theme is that a lot of them had, oh, I was out for like three months with a back injury. I was out for a year with a back injury. And suddenly it gave me this motivation. And I'm like, these are the best to have ever done this sport. And they, sometimes they had to spend a lot of time not rowing. Just accepting that is that this is part of sport is that sometimes our bodies break down a little bit and you hope it happens not at a critical moment in in the season then you just hope that you have an, the right support staff and you have the right tools in the toolkit and the mental fortitude to keep going and yeah and I feel lucky to have gotten through that because you always do your passion reignites after you've been not able to row for a few months you realize how lucky you are to be on the water and how precious few strokes we have left before the Olympics and you spend a lot of months just wishing you were rowing and wishing you were out in the pouring rain (laughs) as crazy as that sounds. And I think being deprived of that for a while, yeah, it just really helps you appreciate it. And it really makes you want to use every moment you can when your body is cooperating. (laughs) Well, take, you know, there's a number of themes there. You take no, take no moment for granted because every moment we have is a gift. And when, when you are existing on the edge, it is so quickly taken away, so quickly taken away. And the other one, it's, it's funny. You're, you're in the depth of pain and you're feeling alone and it brings you to tears yet. It's, you know, you go into the world of podcasts and you're listening to these other athletes, these other high performers, and by hearing the stories of other people, you actually recognize, uh, wait a second, I'm not alone. And I'm not the only one who has gone through this. 
And yeah, I'm, I'm not that special. No, you're, you're, you are yeah. not a special snowflake, <laughs> Hillary Jansons. It's it's a it's a good thought to have. It is it is a humbling thought. That's great. Now, Haley, tell me, when was the last good cry you had? I actually think it is like part of a self defense um, mechanism where I actually kind of start like blanking and not remembering parts that have been my like bad weeks and patches um but just a couple months ago I actually was really struggling in the boat and had to take a couple way a couple weeks away from the, the boat um I've since 2019 been diagnosed with my depression and have had a lot of support from Hillary and Phil and from the entire team and our support staff and just like making sure that I'm running okay and that I am like healthy I took I had to take a couple weeks away from the boathouse and did a lot of work with our with my counselor and our team sports psych and my psychiatrist and adjusted some of my medications that I am on and I was able to come back and I've actually rebounded really well and I'm doing right now like I think the best that I've done in quite a few months and so I just have to think back and it's almost like sometimes you hit like your lowest lows and then your high points start coming pretty soon after sometimes and it's shocking how quickly they can turn around and I was barely getting through a single practice without having to sob my eyes out on every single corner. You're stopping the practice you know you're dealing with you know some sort of depression brain chemistry body chemistry and you said you're on, what kind of, do you mind if I ask what type of medication you're using? Uh, yeah, so I'm currently on, I'm on two medications. And so one of them is, I think, for treating depression and anxiety. And then the other one is more so to help me sleep. Because my psychiatrist has really said how your sleep affects how severe your depression is and whatnot. And so... I've, I have had to cycle through a few different medications to figure and exactly tweak which was going well and which ones don't I don't respond too well. And the balance of the two have been quite good. And of course, like if I didn't need to be on medication, I would not want to be on it. But if they're going to tell me that that's what's going to help me be, be me and enjoy what I'm doing, this is how my psychiatrist and one of my doctors worded it was that it's not the antidepressants making you happy. It's just giving you the tools in your toolbox for you to be able to like be yourself and for you to then find happiness. I was really anti medications um, when I was first diagnosed and it for quite a while made me feel more depressed by the fact that I was on these medications. Just because the feeling of, of guilt or, you know, am I? And the fact of, I, I just felt a lot of, wow, I'm having to take medications to be happy. I'm never going to be happy again. This is just artificial. And the thought of like taking these medications just made me so upset. But then they really worded it as like, you know what? This is the same as like, as if you have a physical injury. It's just in your brain. This is you having some mischemistry in your brain that then these medications are going to help realign it and get these happy sensors firing again so then you're able to like feel those you're able to feel feel again well and it sounds like there's even some you know cognitive distortions going on through there have you as well as medication have you gone through um talk therapy yeah i still i still um through my counselor i do cognitive behavioral therapy yeah um, and I've been doing that since April of 2019. Yeah. Um, it, it, those appointments are just an hour long and they're <laughs> like, if we're going to row and I've just had counseling sometimes, I'll, I, I, I tell Hill every time and I'm like, Hill, I, I have counseling today. Oh boy, get ready. I don't. <laughs> and I'd say like 90% of those appointments I'm crying and they're the hardest hour by far, like a lot of times I'll be finished those and I'll be more tired than, than like a steady state row would make me. And it's because I'm just like working so hard with 
my counselor to just like get my brain firing and talk through the things that you don't want to talk through Mm. really dig into things yeah and a lot of times I start thinking irrationally in my head and I just want to snap at my counselor and be like can we talk about something different and then I'm like no since you're feeling that that probably means you're actually talking about something that you should be talking about yeah excising some demons I'm a big fan of uh, David Burns and the Feeling Good Handbook. Have you been exposed to that? I have not. And so David Burns is an old psychologist from Stanford University. And, you know, even myself, primarily through transition post-sport, I found, you know, I found I go through waves of depression and despondency and even uh, dealing with my own addictions and, um, you know, trying to figure out the next step and the next piece and it's you know cognitive behavioral therapy how i understand it is its roots are in stoic philosophy and there's a lot of stoic you know people pumping up stoicism in popular culture right now but the feeling good handbook has been proven to be as beneficial if not more beneficial than uh, psychiatric drugs mm-hmm and you know, going through the book, and I, I started it up just a month ago, actually, started re-listening to it because my wife, she's gone through a lot of, of health issues and uh, you know, she's, she has Lyme disease, she was bit by a tick, we kind of won't go completely down that rabbit hole, but um, had found that she needed to align her thoughts, behaviors, feelings and actions and was having really difficult it took her about 20 years to figure out what she needed to change in her health and then once she finally figured it out it took her another three or five years to actually now that i know what to do how do i actually do it and a big tool in that toolbox you know was cognitive behavioral therapy and it's helped me it's helped my wife and it sounds like it's helping you you kelly going through all of this and I'm, I'm just fascinated by the the human's mind and you know our ability to identify dissonance mm-hmm. and and when, when we identify the dissonance and we talk it through it can help us process kind of deeper held feelings and deeper held emotions and and get us to a better place have you gone through cognitive behavioral therapy or, or counseling or anything like that, Hillary? Um, no, not, not officially or anything. Um, we have a sports psych, uh, Christy, and I, I keep up with her, and she's certainly been really helpful um, through the last year, especially around COVID when we were, yeah, <laughs> we suddenly had to wait an extra year for the Olympics. Um, I think that was a difficult time for a lot of athletes, um, just kind of, soul searching and wondering uh, why we do this thing that is obviously quite non-essential. Right. Um, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of meaningless. Right? <laughs> it's meaningless and what, pointless. Uh, like, what does it. <laughs> it's easy to think that way. And um, when, yeah, when things are bad, it's, it's uh, easy to go down that road mentally. And um, yeah, it's tough. So what have you learned from Christy? Hillary. Um, I think a lot of it is um, being aware of how how I handle things when I'm stressed and when things are not how I'd like them to be. Um, I think she's just kind of pointed me in some directions, whether it's books or um, just certain theories that can have kind of opened my eyes to how how I can control how I'm feeling and just little strategies to help me when it's difficult and when I can kind of um, make a situation better for myself based on how I respond to things versus kind of just reacting and not, um, not thinking about how my reactions can sometimes make a situation worse. Can you give me a, for instance, a story? Yeah. I just think it's just the classic situation of like (laughs) being an athlete and when you're on the water and, you're exhausted and something happens, say like another boat cuts you off or something. And your first instinct sometimes when you're exercising and you're 
<laughs> short of oxygen, short of breath, like you just yell at someone and just situations like that, you realize that the situation wasn't bad until you reacted to the situation. And then you had to go apologize to the person after. And then I think it's often how you react can really change the direction of how a situation goes. Well, I'm, I'm curious about that. And I'm, th- that instance, particularly, you know, you get short of breath, there's low oxygen, your higher thinking function is starting to shut down, you get short, you get angry, you get aggressive. And this happened time and time again, where we would just be like shouting at each other, calling each other names, you know, that fire. When I was an athlete, I sometimes it scared you. And other times you thought, well, that almost contributes to like the fire of the race because it's going to be hard in the race. And that was at least the story I was telling myself. And so like, what's, what's that limit? You know, how much fire do you want to put out and how much fire do you want to hold on to, to make sure that you can be competitive and be at your best when you're sitting on the start line in, in Tokyo? I think for me, something that I've learned kind of slowly throughout my rowing career, just being on the national team where every week, twice a week, you're, you're racing against your teammates and other boats in the program to guide it, get the top prognostic or percentage of gold medal standard. And I, I, I would not always do super well on those, um, or like the boats that I was in, cause I've never been in a single, <laughs> um, but I started to realize that to wind myself up so much for a workout on a Wednesday morning usually didn't end in a good thing because if if I won then oh great you won this random workout in the winter I think Kaylee and I do this really well where the workouts that we know that we're going all in on this um, they're almost few and far between and we know that getting into that mindset only when you really need it only for a 2k race I think being able to do that and doing your best all the time on other workouts but also just understanding that those other workouts are only helping to prepare you and they're only helping for you to feel the boat and to work together and to push hard physically. And that result middle of the week in April or May or whenever is not actually going to change anything about how you're going to perform in a couple months. Right. Um, But being able to put yourself in immense pressure for that one race every couple months, like we've been doing um, domestically since COVID being able to do that and really getting fired up for those. That's when you need to channel that intense emotion and almost anger. If, if that's, if that's your thing for what you need to race. I think I realized over the years, it's emotionally exhausting to get yourself fired up like that um, twice a week, every week, as if, this win is the win that matters when it's usually not. There's a lot of maturity in that hill. I really appreciate, you know, your insight. You know, it's a peak moment f- f- for a reason. It's the Olympic race for a reason. Because if you were racing like you were at the Olympic final every single day, you would quickly burn out and you wouldn't have, you know, the emotional energy to maintain that fire over the long term. And you know, and as you say that, I can see how I, I can think of athletes I've observed in my experience who have burnt out because they brought too much fire too often and not in the right time. And I also had, you know, a coach who said, you can probably only get to that level three, maybe four times a year where you're channeling everything and you're going all out, all aft at it because it takes a long time to recover from that. I love that Hillary is saying this because I do like so many times I think back on, I think I'm oftentimes the one that just wants to go so hard and wants to like, be like, Ooh, let's win this workout and this work and workout. And Hillary is very good for our crew. at just like bringing us back and being like, okay, let's have some perspective. Like, these are our goals. These are the objectives. If we do that, then we're yeah. on track. Well, let's talk about the partnership because we're, and we're going to skip forward because we've covered a lot of ground and I want to talk about the two of you and how you, how you work together and then talk about your projections for Tokyo. 
because you have you you talked about you have a difference in size you have a you have a difference in personality yet your partnership is remarkably successful hillary you're the calm cool one kaylee's the spark plug <laughs> it's, 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 is that how it works <laughs> well, i don't i don't know if you've got that the other way around <laughs> In in the boat, I think actually Kaylee is definitely the more calm one. Um, well, that's exactly the opposite of what she just explained. But um, <laughs> she's she's the one who does the talking in the boat. She's she's just consistent in her role, and in a race, she's sits back there and just. I know that no one else is gonna tell me what to do more more precisely than Kaylee and when to do it. Like I really trust her the way she reads other boats when we're beside them and yeah. And just off the water and in everything else, I couldn't imagine a partner who's more supportive. She's always trying to make sure everyone around her, which luckily for me is I'm her only teammate. So I get a lot of, (laughs) I get a lot of love from Kaylee. Um, (laughs) If she was in, if she was in an eight, she'd have eight other people to spread all her love around, but she dumps a lot of it on me. And um I think that's why I love being in a pair is that you're just so dependent on each other that that relationship is, it's going to take you through the tough moments in training and in racing. And every moment that we've spent in the boat together or out of the boat, like that's, that's all going to pay off when we're under pressure. Love fest. What's, what's amazing about, (laughs) what's amazing about Hillary? Oh, oh boy. So, I'm going to spill a, a little nickname for Hillary on the team, but it's Killery or Killer Killery J. <laughs> Killery J. <laughs> for a while, it was it's, it's a hashtag on Instagram, hashtag Killery J. It is just a known thing on the team that she is absolutely killer. And she goes into killer, we call it, she's in killer mode. And there is not a chance that I would want to be in another country's boat, lining up against her. Just to speak to her rowing terms, not even just Hillary as a person. Interestingly enough, we were on a run um, a couple days ago, and I was even talking about this, and I was like, Hillary, I think that when I sit at the start line with you, what makes me so calm is knowing just what an insane and incredible racer she is. And she just goes tunnel vision and absolutely lays down exactly what she's been doing every single day in training and there's no guessing of what's going to happen it's just Hillary's a workhorse and if she's not tired during training she's upset it means that she's not doing enough like she strives on being tired and then you take that taper and you have all these matches and then it is just lethal. I remember going into 2018 World Champs. Um, at the time, our coach Dave, we had a little pissing match after this thousand meter max piece, and it was one of our last workouts going into um, one of our earlier round races. Hill wrote it down at race pace instead of max or something, and he got mad at us when we came on land, and then it was a uh, ah! And I'm just sitting there as little, little person in the middle going, oh boy, oh boy. And then <laughs> he was like, what are you doing? Like, this isn't going to set you up for racing. And that was not a good performance for you. And uh, you should have taken the opportunity to just like re- really go for it. And the next day we had two by 250. And I will never forget these pieces. We... <laughs> <laughs> there was the most insane killer mode and they were supposed to be race paced these this day not max the first piece i think we took off and we didn't go down in a pair below like 42 i think we we're between 42 and 44 the entire time and i think we had split pretty much i don't think we went above like a 132 130 and pretty much held the max speed that I've ever hit in a pair over 250 meters and the entire time I thought I had been held hostage 
and <laughs> he was like, I have the strongest partner in the entire world. This is nuts. I remember that thousand meter piece and I remember it. We were, it was supposed to be race pace and it was actually under race pace. And I was like, not pleased with it when I was doing it. And I think when we got off the water and Dave pointed it out and I was like, well, yeah, I know that wasn't race pace. I think the other thing he said that bothered me was like, oh, I don't think that would prepare you for the race. So he kind of said, you didn't do that well. And I agreed I didn't, we didn't do that well. But the part of it that I think flipped a switch in me was like, oh, that means you might not be prepared for your world championship race. And I'm like, oh, that's a problem. Like, I need to prove him that I'm ready. The next day, I was just like, he wants to see us going fast before the race. I'll do it. I'll show him. (laughs) (laughs) Killery J. Hashtag. (laughs) Engage. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I think just any um, questioning of my effort is I I take that personally and I and Keely said all that wonderful thing about me being such a good racer but I think we need to remember we're in a pair and I think a pair of all the boat classes is if you don't time your blades I only have one blade and she only has one blade and if they're not timed together and if our bodies aren't timed together if our legs aren't pushing together the boat's gonna go slow so she's saying all that amazing stuff about me but the reality is, is that she's doing that at all the same time. And she's actually having to follow someone, which is even harder. I'm just doing whatever the heck I want up there. And Kaylee is somehow following all these, uh, all these crazy things I'm doing and making the boat go straight. And she's looking around. And so, but this is what we say, you know, in the corporate world, what we say, you need to put the right people in the right seats of the boat. And so you, what I'm hearing right now is that the right people are in the right seats of the boat because Hillary, you know, say disc, right? You've got dominance, you know, inspiration, uh, conscientious and steady. You, you, you know, you want the D in the stroke seat and you want the, you know, the I and S in, you know, in the bow seat, because if you put Kaylee in the stroke seat, it probably wouldn't work. It does wouldn't not. work as well. <laughs> No, because the, and you you wouldn't follow Kaylee as well. You would support her as well. You don't know how, and you couldn't, you couldn't, (laughs) you couldn't, you couldn't support her the way that Kaylee supports you and Kaylee couldn't lead you the way that you lead her. And that's what makes that would, that's what makes the partnership so incredibly powerful and inspirational, really, you know, when you, when you look at it, from the outside and you see how how differently so many of us are made yet when we find a way to take advantage of those differences and come together we create this synergy that amplifies one another's strengths and takes advantage of it yeah absolutely i think that's what i love about rowing in general is that not everyone is six feet tall and um, built the same way but and even everyone rows differently, even if their body types are different, are the same. And any boat class from, well, not really a single, like they're really alone, but like from a pair all the way to an eight, it's really about putting the right people in the right spots in the boat. And it's not only about their physical abilities, but about their, how they operate and how they mentally approach things. And when you see a lineup that has the right people in the right seats, um, it's just cool to watch those boats operate as they row past. And I think the va- what you say values too, I think that that's been something really big for Hill and I in the pair is that, of course, there's like so many different ways that you can train and get the same result. Um, or, or in terms of like training plans, I mean, and I think it is just like finding what works for you. Hill and I are both like pretty similar and just like are the way that we function and I think that we just love being exhausted and training and working really, really hard. Hill said all those nice things about me, but at the same time, I mean, about me, but at the same time, like, I think that she's had really (laughs) big patience, even for instance, with like, when I'm mentally not doing well, like, she completely is just like, okay, how do I support you? And so it's just like that dynamic that we just have grown over the years for each other and recognizing that we're very different people, but we have the same goal. 
and we are able to like respect that each other's different but then know that how each of us needs to support one another might look a little bit different but that what we found now is like really it works well well what a what a lesson for teamwork i <laughs> i wish i could have you with some of the executive teams i have to coach <laughs> <laughs> just be aware and i'm you know, and this is something that you know i hope you take with you to your life beyond sport uh because you know by recognizing one you know who you are as individuals is so powerful and it puts you leaps and bounds beyond other people in their own psychological personal development and two recognizing the differences in one another and how you have to you know flex and adapt to support each other is such a powerful toolkit in, you know, not just in sport, but in, in life in general and in doing any, any big thing, whether it's a business goal, whether it's trying to make a, a relationship or a marriage work, or whether it's, you know, trying to achieve something, you know, political. So it's, I, you know, I find it truly inspirational the way that you're approaching this. Let's look forward to Tokyo. We got Hashtag Hill and Phil in the pair. Hashtag Killery J. Talk through, you know, a visualization of of Tokyo, and part of this is I'm I'm doing research. I'm the the commentator for CBC, you know, so I want I want to learn from you interesting facts about your opponents so I can give better commentary. But then I'm also interested about your race and what you're envisioning with that. So first off, let's start at a high level. Tell me about the field. If if you're aware of the field, who you're looking out for, or if you're primarily internally focused, and then we'll go into yeah, what you're picturing to the happen Kiwis in Tokyo. are definitely, I would say, the ones to beat. They're double gold medalists at World Championships in 2019 in the pair and the eight. And they're planning to double up at the Olympics, which is a pretty big deal. Both Kaylee and I and the Aussies also doubled up in 2019 in the pair in the eight, just in the qualification year. Every boat is trying to qualify as many spots as possible. And in the eight, you have to come top five. So the margins are pretty, pretty tight. And for a big sweep country like Canada to not qualify in eight would be quite bad. So the decision was made to strengthen the eight. And we also, as a program, qualified the pair for an eight, which was huge. And we, we didn't know the year ahead that we had, well, the two years ahead that we had, but keeping those extra four, getting those extra four seats qualified has been massive for, for our women's team. Um, the momentum that we have is, is really big. And um, yeah, we were, we were really proud of that. And just, that was really special to be a part of and to help, yeah, get as many people as we can to the games. Two-time Olympic champion in the women's pair, Helen Glover is back with a new partner from GB after having some children. So they'll also be interesting to see. And I, I would love to race <laughs> someone with those accolades. I think that's that would be pretty cool just to get to race her. And yeah, the Americans will be strong. Romania will be strong. And I think going into the racing, we're prepared for the heat to play a factor. So. We've done some heat sessions in Victoria just to see how our bodies respond. And I think that's that's kind of put us in the mindset that it, it's going to be tough when we go to Japan. It's going to be really humid. So tell me about the heat sessions. Are you, are you, do you create a sauna and put some rowing machines in there or what? That's pretty close to it. Yeah, <laughs> a little uh, heated trailer um, out the, outside the Pacific Institute of Sport. Yeah, just with some spin bikes in, and we did a, a full heat week in January, uh, 90 minutes a day, to just acclimatize and see what happened to our core body temperature, and that was really quite telling, just because you kind of underestimate how tough the heat is for your body to handle when you're not in extreme heat all the time. Like, in the winter in Canada, we don't sweat liters and liters every day even though we're working out because of the colder temperature. And I think um, just knowing that our physiologists and our the whole support staff are really 
dialed in and making sure that they have every box ticked in terms of how to help us handle the heat and how to pre-cooling strategies, post-cooling strategies, how much you should be drinking, electrolytes, everything. There's not one little detail that they're not thinking about and there's not one resources that we don't have access to in terms of preparing ourselves mentally and physically for the heat. Mm -hmm. What did you learn? So Paul, like put on your biology hat, Hillary, and tell me, tell me what you learned about the heat and the adaptation. Well, the main thing with why Tokyo is going to be so difficult to, so difficult to manage the heat is sweating cools us off because of when the sweat evaporates, that's actually what's cooling us. So if you're in an environment where the atmosphere is very humid, you're sweating a lot, but your sweat's not evaporating off of your body. And so that's why it's really not cooling you very much. So you're sweating buckets and yet your core temperature keeps rising. And depending on the person, you could get pretty, you could get pretty bad, <laughs> bad symptoms from, from the heat. So, yeah. And in terms of adaptation, I know that over time, like just in a week when you do a lot of heat training, I think one of the main things that you're trying to boost is your blood plasma. If you subject yourself to that amount of heat, working out in that heat, then over a certain number of days, your blood plasma will be higher and your blood plasma has the water. And so you'll just be able to handle the heat a little bit more and become less dehydrated. Okay, you go over, you're in Japan, you go through the heat adaption. Uh, there's the Kiwis, the Aussies, GB, Americans. You're getting ready for the race. You have some high quality competition that's there. You're elevated. You're now the strongest you've been. You're ready to race. Walk me through that. What's your approach and how do you dial in and stay dialed for that regatta? I'd say the exciting part I think it's also the nerve wracking part, but the exciting part is that we haven't raced since the 2019 world championships. And so there is a lot of unexpected. This is something that hasn't happened going into, into like an Olympic games where there is so much unknown. And so I think it is just like, we exactly what you're saying. We have to trust that we are the fittest, strongest, most powerful that we've ever been. And if I'm envisioning sitting at the start line, it's exactly, it's like in 2018 in our final and it's what separated us versus the Kiwi boat from like the bronze medal. And I remember it was miles back between second and third place. And it literally was, it wasn't us going, oh, we want to go and get a medal. We just went and raced and we're like, we're going to race because we want to win gold and we think we can. And so it didn't matter how fast we were going. It didn't matter what we were doing. We we're just like, we know that there is something in every single one of our 500s that no matter what the Kiwis try to throw at us, we can fight back and we can win. I think that rather than worrying about like, oh, the Kiwis have this, I think the Australians have this, GB, US, instead of thinking of it as like, there's all these really fast crews, I want to envision just going in there knowing that we have what it takes and that we're just going to race rather than like race to medal. We're going to race to like win gold. And that if you just have that like bulletproof mentality and you stick to like exactly what you've been planning that like, hopefully at the end of the day, that that's what's going to take you there and drive you there because it allows you to stay confident and I think when you have confidence, of course, like, of course, there's going to be hard times. But then when you have the confidence that you've like gotten through everything and that you just know that you can do it and that all you need is each other and that you don't need to do anything different than what you've done in training. It just like for me, that allows me to breathe. And so I just like I'm like, you know what? We're sitting here. We love rowing together. Well, let's just go have fun and race and win. Yeah. <laughs> bulletproof. Well, it's bulletproof. And I think there's something I want to say about the Kiwis too, because the women's field has become more and more competitive over the years. And the field is deeper and the field is stronger. And I think doubling up for the Kiwis is a mistake for them and will put them at a serious disadvantage. And I think you will have the advantage because of that. What do you think? 
our, our coach actually, Phil, mentioned this the other day. He had spoken to the physiologist and he, he just said to us, he said, pushing, racing a boat that's racing twice, twice as much as you are in the heat like that, the biggest opportunity to get a leg up on them is in the first 500 when you're using more anaerobic energy and you're using more power versus the middle of the race. And we know the Kiwis are super comfortable in the middle of the race if they're out in front because their baseline speed, they're just so relaxed at race pace. And when you're leading 500 meters into a 2000 meter race, the psychology is really, it's way more comfortable than if you're a boat length down or if you're tied 500 meters in. And so I think that's, that's where I think we can make them pay (laughs) for, for doubling up and doing the eight as well, because that's going to be pretty taxing in the heat. Uh, Make. Yeah. That's, that's a file that one away, Kaylee. Make them pay. Well, I, I hesitated to say that because I, <laughs> I hope they don't listen to this, and because I, I don't like giving people ammo. But <laughs> well, at, at the end of the day, it's it's their mistake, I think. Hill and I have actually talked about this recently, and it's like I think on uh, on the other end of the stick, it's like, man, I think every country should be doing heat training, and I know I've seen some pictures from their team on social media of doing heat training, and clearly you're not going to make that decision to double up if you don't think you can do it. And so if I was in their shoes and I, or if I'm looking at it and being like, okay, they're making the decision to double up. I think that they must think that they can win both. And so I think it doesn't really change the fact where I'm like, well, I'm running the pair and my goal is to win gold with Hillary. They are so incredibly fit. And the Kiwis always have just like, prided themselves on like miles make champions like i'm not shocked that they've made that decision because you're still doing one 2k a day and you're gonna have time to recover and so i i don't expect them to be any less spicy for us (laughs) i love i love the strategy of the more you can make them suffer their anaerobic recovery will be less you know it's 36 hours for an optimal anaerobic recovery and you know, it's an opportunity. That's exciting. So let's let's talk about beyond. You've driven it. You've had your best row at at Tokyo. It's been a silent time trial. There's no one in the stands. You finish. You call your moms. You hop on a flight. You come straight home. What's next? Oh, well, I'm I'm currently studying to take the MCAT, the Medical College Admissions Test, and so. I have that booked for September, so I'll be probably just enjoying some small hikes and camping and whatnot, and also just studying to try to get into med school to become a doctor, give back to society. <laughs> yeah, so to become a doctor, and you say give back, because it is it is a selfish pursuit. And this is one thing I struggled with over and over again, because why does this have to be all about me? Why does this have to be all about the sport? Why does it have to be all about making boats go fast? And is there some way that I can contribute a little bit more? That sort of ate at me and gnawed at me. And it sounds a little bit like that. And you're treating your your medical profession and that future path as a way to become more, more in touch with your ability to contribute. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to last year. Um, during COVID where we realized that when, uh, when society is hurting, it's not necessarily the Olympic athletes who come to save the day. It's the people with, who are trained to help society in other ways, healthcare and providing food. My family are dairy farmers. And so they were an essential service and they certainly never stopped when the pandemic hit. I think just, it was, it was pretty difficult personally to realize that at the age of 25, 26, I really, couldn't do much to help (laughs) my community in a time of need. I've just always been kind of interested in the human body and medicine, and I love a good challenge. So I think that's, I'm looking forward to pursuing it. So I have a little bit of a different path than Hillary. I don't have my undergrad degree. It's coming up on seven years since I started my undergrad, and eventually because I wasn't very far along in my school, I made the decision to prioritize rowing over school after 
trying again to kind of like do both and I really admire people who do who are able to make it work but it got to the point where at the time like Dave kind of had told me like you're trying to run high performance academic like a like a high performance academic person and you're trying to run as a high high performance rower at like a center and because I was in Victoria it wasn't like I was going and training in a program where the schedule was like based around school I was in Victoria trying to train based on a training center program while being in school and so yeah I had, in 2018 I trained with the U- UVic team and then just came on camps and that was when Hillary and I were first put together going into 2018 but then after that year I completely stopped school and so now I'm going to be finishing Tokyo without my undergrad still like because of transferring I lost quite a bit of credits and had to retake some classes and then when I was here, I think I failed a couple classes from going on training camps and lab professors that weren't too happy with me missing a lab. And so that caused me to fail a couple classes. Long story short, I, I, I haven't really progressed in my academics. And through COVID, I am so grateful because I got to make a lot of new friends in the cycling community when um, I struggled with the delay of the Olympics for rowing and so I did most of my training on the bike and that was when I made um some friends that then kind of inspired me to like open my mind and think about like what it'll be like when I'm not rowing and the fact that I'm gonna have more time and I'm gonna be able to like really go for anything that I want to do and so I've been accepted into a program to start engineering in the engineering transfer program at Camosun. To inspiring women to inspiring athletes and you know all the best to you in the remainder of your uh, training the remainder of your preparation and uh, it was you know it was an inspiring conversation so thank you for taking this time and um, train hard we'll be cheering for you in Tokyo awesome thank you Adam Hill and Phil what a pair so kind and softly spoken from Killary Jansons <laughs> as she's kindly referred to uh, in the training center a few things uh, stand out especially from what um, Hillary had said one being that we must push our limits we need to push our limits physically mentally emotionally and what she told me about crying really uh, sort of struck a chord if you're not pushing yourself to the point where you might feel like crying or you might be crying on a regular basis, are you really pushing hard enough? Are you? Have you pushed yourself to that limit recently? Another piece I found quite fascinating in the conversation is about how she differentiated between day-to-day training and periodized all-in competitions. It takes a lot of, again, physical, mental, emotional energy to really ramp yourself up and go all in for a big race. But you can't do that every single day. Peak performance is called peak performance for a reason. It's peak performance because it's at the the top of something. It, It only happens every once in a while. And there's a difference between workouts and performances. And this is something that I see in my own practice as uh, an executive business coach. There's a difference between, you know, your day to day best and your high performing events best. We need to make sure that we've identified the right spacing between high moments of push where 100% of our mental, physical, emotional energy needs to be there. And the other times when we need to show up, we need to be a professional, we need to put the work in and tick it over and get another one done. Great insights. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Hillary. Great athletes, great insights. I thought, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you're enjoying this podcast and are wired for growth, Check out my audiobook or paperback called The Responsibility Ethic. I wrote this book for listeners keen to carve their own path to achievement. You'll find 20 years of my life experience summarized into seven hours of listening, or 
3.5 hours if you're like me and listen to all your audiobooks at two times speed. <laughs> You'll find business case studies and personal development insights packed in a narrative of Olympic failure, Olympic victory, and yes, there's my team's rowboat capsize in the Bermuda Triangle. Find the audiobook or paperback where all good books are sold, including Amazon, Indigo, and Audible. For more information, visit my website, creekspeak.com. That's K-R-E-E-K-S-P-E-A-K.com. Thank you for listening to Roro Tokyo. Again, I'm your host, Adam Creek. Feel free to reach out to me with comments on Twitter at Adam Creek. That's at sign A-D-A-M-K-R-E-E-K. No, it's not like the river or the squeaky door. It's a creek with a K. A huge thank you to our title sponsor of this podcast, Nicola Wealth, the gold standard of investment advice for affluent families, foundations, and institutions across North America. And another thank you to Whitehall Rowing and Sail and the Oarboard, which is the transportable, collapsible rower that you can take anywhere. Thank you, Rowing Canada, for your support to wrangle these athletes. And thank you, CBC, for promoting these conversations on your massive platform. This show is produced by the wonderful Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions. The sound is edited and mixed by the creative Danelle Cloutier.